All right, we are continuing our study of the Gospel of Matthew here on the Listener's Commentary. And on this recording, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 through 30. And as always, let's just make sure we recall the context. We're right in the middle of Jesus' teaching. He's just at the end of chapter 24 called his followers, us, to be alert and prepared for his arrival, for his parousia, because it's going to come suddenly and unexpectedly. And he illustrates this call to be alert and ready Uh, with three illustrations, one at the end of chapter 24 about a faithful and responsible servant, and then two more here in this first part of chapter 25. The first one is in 25, 1 through 13. It's about 10 young maidens and some lamp oil. And the theme of that little illustration is about planning ahead so that you're ready. The final illustration then comes in 25, 14 through 30, and it's about a man going on a journey and leaving leaving his uh, estate in the care of some servants and actually giving them some money to use and invest on behalf of his estate. And the theme of that illustration is really about faithfully using what the master has entrusted to you. All three of these illustrations paint key pictures of what Jesus has in mind by being alert and prepared for his arrival. So, Let's look at this illustration that shows up here in 25, 1 through 13. It's the second of the three, because the first one's at the end of chapter 24. And it's a story about young maidens, olive oil, and the coming of a groom. And as you listen to the story, make sure you pay attention to the idea of coming out to meet the groom that shows up at the beginning and in the middle and at the end of this story. So it begins like this, chapter 25, verse 1, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins, that's 10 young maidens, who took their lamps and went out to meet the groom. Uh, The lamps are small little olive oil lamps. They got a little bit of oil in the basin and a wick sticking out. And they're going out to meet the groom. And Jesus' story assumes a traditional Middle Eastern village wedding. And so in order to make sense of the story, we need to understand how those celebrations typically went down. In fact, a very helpful resource for this is Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes by Ken Bailey. So here's how those wedding celebrations went. They almost always were held at night. And the celebration is going to be held at the groom's house where a bunch of family and friends have gathered and they're ready for the party. And when everything is ready, the groom and some of his friends make their way across town, maybe even to a neighboring village, but they make their way to where the bride is at. And they're going to pick up the bride and some of her family and friends. And the bride would typically be placed on a donkey or some other riding animal like that. And now the bride, her family and friends, uh, the groom and his friends, they all now form sort of a chaotic, exuberant parade, wandering up and down as many streets as possible through the village so that as many people in the village can cheer and shout and clap and applaud. And it's this big sort of uh, parade through town. And then finally... At some point, they're going to make it all the way back to the groom's house for the celebration. That's what's happening in this story. And notice that you have in this story 10 young ladies who are waiting somewhere back near the groom's house. They're going to be part of kind of the group that actually gets to go into the groom's house and enjoy the wedding feast, enjoy the whole celebration. So they're waiting for this parade to get back and the party to begin. And since it's night, they have their little oil lamps with them because no woman, young or old, would be out at night without one. That's the setting. And so here's what happens. Verse 2, five of those young maidens were foolish and five were prudent. In other words, five were thoughtful and five, well, they didn't plan ahead. They didn't have any forethought. And so that's what we get. Five were foolish and five were prudent. And this actually highlights the key idea Jesus wants to get across for us about his return at the end of the age. Making preparations for it and being ready is key. So what's the difference between the thoughtful young maidens and the foolish young maidens? Well, the story continues in verse 3. For, explaining, notice, when the foolish took their lamps, they did not take any extra oil with them. But the prudent ones, the thoughtful ones, they took some extra oil in flasks with their lamps. 
That's the difference. The thoughtful, prudent girls planned ahead. They knew how these parties go. Uh, they know that you, you, know, you don't really know how long it may take for them to get there, get everyone gathered up, uh, make their way through all the streets of town. So who knows how long it might be until they get back to the groom's house. So those thoughtful girls, well, they made sure they have enough extra oil just in case it took longer than they thought. But the foolish ones, well, they didn't plan ahead. So here's how the story unfolds. Verse 5. Now, when the groom was delaying, it was taking longer to get back than anyone expected. All these girls became drowsy and fell asleep. But at midnight, there finally was a shout. Behold, the groom, come out to meet him. That's the whole point of this, right? Come out to meet him. And so uh, the, as the groom finally gets closer, a runner runs ahead announcing his arrival so that everyone can come and join the parade and usher him back into his home and the full-on wedding and wedding party can happen. So verse 7, all those virgins, the young maidens, got up and trimmed their lamps. So roused from their sleep, the 10 young girls jump up. They make sure their lamps are lit. And that's when the five foolish ones realize their mistake. Verse 8, but the foolish virgins said to the prudent ones, give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. However, the prudent ones answered, Oh, no, there's most certainly wouldn't be enough for us and you as well. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourself. It's the middle of the night, but this is a big celebration for the village. So people all over town are still awake. That's the whole point of the parade. Everyone usually knows everyone in such a village anyhow. So go get some oil for yourself. That's what they tell them. There's not enough in our little flask for our lamps and for yours. Go get your own oil. And so... Those five foolish ones hurry off to acquire some oil. But, verse 10, while they were on their way to buy the oil, the groom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. A typical home in uh, this time and place would have a walled courtyard with a door facing to the street. And so as the parade finally arrives at the groom's house, uh, they come to that door Everyone enters into the big courtyard. They shut and lock the door and it's time for the wedding and the wedding feast. But the five foolish maidens, well, they're out looking for oil. So what happens when they finally come back? Well, look at verse 11. Yet later, the other virgins, the maidens also came saying, Lord, Lord, open for, up for us. They're pounding on that door uh, to the street and they're asking to be let in. And now in verse 12 and 13, we get the punchline of the parable. But he answered and said, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. And then Jesus tells us, here's the point. Be on the alert then because you do not know the day nor the hour. That was the point he made at the end of chapter 24 about when his arrival would come. You don't know when it's going to happen. So you got to be ready at any moment because it's going to come at a time you do not expect. And what this parable reminds us just by way of reflection is that we need to be prepared for the long haul. The scary warning in this parable is that the five foolish uh, maidens represent people who consider themselves disciples. They're friends of the groom, but they don't, really don't plan ahead to be ready at any moment. And so guess what happens? They miss out. Faithful disciples make preparations to be ready at any moment and are prepared to be faithful over the long haul. And that's the point of this little parable that Jesus just told us. Well, Jesus follows this up with a third and final parable about his perusia. Remember, the disciples had asked him about the destruction of Jerusalem and about his coming. Most of chapter 24 is actually about the first question, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. But at the end of chapter 24, he shifts to talking about his coming. And then on into 25, he's still talking about that. And his point is, he makes about his coming is no one knows, not even Jesus himself, he said, knows. Only the Father knows. So you need to be ready and you need to be alert. And so he's giving a series of parables or a series of illustrations about being ready. And so here, beginning in verse 14, is the final one. It says this, for it is, that is his arrival, 
Uh, His coming is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. So Jesus is going to highlight three specific slaves, three specific servants, and each one is given a different amount of money to faithfully use on his master's behalf while his master is away. So to one, he gave five talents, to another, two talents, and to another, one each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. So the master is going on this journey, and he entrusts five, two, and one talents to different servants. Now, these, when we say five talents or two talents or even one talent, these are substantial sums of money. A talent roughly was about 20 years wages for the average worker. Think of that, 20 years wages. So five talents, well, that's more than the average person made in a lifetime. And even one talent, that's still a lot of money. So these are huge sums of money. And as the story unfolds, Jesus tells us what each one of these persons does with the sums of money that's entrusted to them. So verse 16, the one who had received the five talents immediately went and did business with them and earned five more. He doubled his talents. So now he has 10 talents, massive amount of money. In the same way, the one who had received two talents earned two more, went and did business, uh, doubled his output, right? But he who received the one talent went away, dug a hole in the ground, and hid his master's money. He didn't invest it. He didn't do any business with it. He just buried it. The story continues in verse 19, and Jesus says, Now, after a long time. And I think that's just important to notice that all three of the parables emphasize this, say this in some sort of way, that Jesus, uh, Jesus's return is appearing, it's probably a long way off, that there's waiting, there's watching, there's being prepared over the long haul. And here the phrase is very explicit. Now, after a long time, so the master's gone for quite a while. After a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. So he's entrusted them these large sums of money to to faithfully use while he's away. And so now it's time to settle accounts. And here's how that plays out. Verse 20, the one who had received the five talents came up and brought the five more talents saying, master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I've earned five more talents. And his master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. It's a little ironic. He says you were faithful with few things. Five talents is not a few things. It's a lot. But he was faithful with five. Now he has 10. So he's been faithful. And that's the key idea. In fact, the servant who did business with two actually gets the exact same response as the one with five. Uh, And also notice you were faithful with a few things. Now I'm going to entrust you with many things, with more things. Being trustworthy and faithful leads to greater responsibility. I know I can trust you with it. I know you can handle it. I know you'll take care of it. And that's what happens to this man who had five talents and earned five more. Same thing happened to the one with two. Look at verse 22. And the one who had received two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have earned two more. And his master says the exact same thing to him. Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Same response because of his faithfulness. But the one who had received one talent, well, look what happens. Verse 24. Now, the one who had received the one talent also came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you do not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed. And I was afraid. So I went away and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you still have what's yours. I didn't lose any money, but I also didn't make any money. This guy, he says, I was afraid. He didn't want to mess up. He didn't want to lose any money. So his solution, do nothing. Just bury it. And that way, I won't lose anything and all should be well. And he did this because he thought his master was a tough taskmaster. So he figured it was just better to hold on to his money rather than risk losing it. But in reality, it seems he completely misunderstood his master. 
Look at verse 26. His master answered and said to him, You worthless, lazy slave. Did you know that I reap where I did not sow and I gather where I didn't scatter seed? That, that's what you thought I was? Well, then you at least ought to have put my money in the bank. And on my arrival, I would have received my money back with interest. Like, if you really thought I was that tough and that harsh, don't you think you should have at least done something useful with my money? And he calls him a worthless and lazy slave. Uh, the master diagnoses the heart of the problem. It's he's lazy. He didn't want to put in the work to figure out the best way forward. He took the easy path because he was a lazy and worthless slave. I mean, if he really thought his master was that tough of a taskmaster, then man, you should have at least figured out something useful to do with the money that he entrusted to you. But he didn't. So look at the response given to him from the master. Verse 28, Therefore, take the talent away from him and give it to the one who has ten talents. Because that guy's proved trustworthy. The master knows that extra talent, well, it's in good hands with that one. Why? Because he was faithful and responsible, and he knows he can trust him with more things. And then Jesus says, For to everyone who has, more shall be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who doesn't have, even what he does have shall be taken away, because he's proven faithless and untrustworthy and irresponsible, so even what little he might have, that's going to be taken away and it's going to be given to the one who actually has proven to be responsible and trustworthy. And then Jesus says in verse 30, and throw the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The faithful and trustworthy and responsible servants, well, they get to enter into the joy of their master, but not this one, not the useless lady, lazy servant. He gets left out in the cold, out in the dark, by himself, where there's, where there's tears of sorrow and mourning, and where there's grinding of teeth in regret and resentment. That's where he's left. And this last parable of the series of three reminds us that as we wait for the Lord's return, then our responsibility is to faithfully use what he's given us to faithfully use what he's entrusted to us, however little or much it might be, to faithfully use it so that we can be ready for his arrival, to use it for his purposes, to use it according to his agenda, to use it for his good so that when he returns, we can say, look, Lord, you entrusted me with this, and as a result, I used it for your purposes, and here's what's to show for it. And he can say to you and to I, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. All right, thanks for tuning into this session of the Listener's Commentary on the New Testament. The Listener's Commentary is a listener-supported, crowdfunded Bible teaching ministry that's only possible by the generosity of folks just like you. So if you're one of those who supports this ministry, let me just say from the bottom of my heart, thanks a ton. God is using your generosity for his honor and glory all around the world. And uh, I am so grateful to you for that. And if you've been blessed or impacted by this ministry in some way, could I invite you to prayerfully consider if you want to join the team of supporters? And the way to do that is to swing over to listenerscommentary.com, click the Give button, and you can put in a dollar amount right there. And you can even make that a monthly by clicking that box that says make this a monthly donation. Or you can leave it as a one-time gift for the ministry there. All those funds are received in partnership with World Family Mission, and those funds come my way to help support this ministry so they can continue to grow and increase. Thanks a ton for your support.